Good morning, and thank you so much for uh, the invite to address you. So isn't this what we want, to be able to do more with less, right? And the question is, so when we do more with less, do we actually take it into account? And so that's what I'm going to talk to you a bit about this morning. Um, a short overview, we're going to talk for just for the first you know, three minutes or so about evolution and prostate cancer grading. I think most people are aware of this. There may be some nuance. Focus most of the talk on issues of tumor quantitation and where we may not, or existing models may not have taken into account what's in pretty much every pathology report for, in some cases, the past 20 years, in some cases, the past 10 years, and much more uh, significantly, the past three to five years. Um, the, it was mentioned by Dr. Carroll, the notion of crib reform, and I'll add intraductal carcinoma and where things are going with that. And then in general, at least from a pathology perspective, how we incorporate these new markers, echoing some of the, uh, some of the comments made earlier. So just to take you back to origins, because I don't know uh, other than maybe Dr. Sagani, Dr. Her, a couple others who have been here uh, before, this is a copy of Gleason's original hand-drawn diagram that he provided to Dr. Reuter when he visited in the uh, in the memorial in the 80s. Um, what was fairly amazing about this is he was pretty on target in terms of uh, taking a system for prostate cancer grading that's solely based on architecture. Um, it's the only system, even with all the modifications and codifications, that has remained essentially in its essence intact across all cancers in all organs. Um, he also had the novelty to look at the clinical outcome in these patients and say that a first plus second most common score actually mattered. It wasn't just the most common. Importantly, though, this was in an era of no screening. Most patients presented with advanced disease, and there were no systematic biopsies. So what triggered the evolution? Well, obviously, there was the advent of thin needle biopsies, systematic sampling that rapidly went from 2 to 6 to 12 and maybe more. Um, and so pathologists were called upon to diagnose and grade smaller samples, an increased volume of cases, and importantly, beginning in the late 90s, the, the import of the Gleason score in almost every predictive model for prostate cancer, regardless of state. Um, all caused evolution in the application of Gleason grading. And so the International Society of Urologic Pathology, through multiple consensus conferences and arguments, frankly, um, codified this evolution. And so these are diagrams that are handed to every first day resident in pathology as they begin to look at prostate cancer. And what this has had the effect of, to really draw it out, is if you look at this, it's had the effect of narrowing pattern three. This is really important from 2005 to 2014 especially, because that squarely enters the era of active surveillance, when we want to be able to say, this is a three, and that's not. Um, and the elimination of cribriform glands, which we'll get to more later, um, and poorly formed glands, which are much less well understood from pattern three, and the inclusion of pattern three variants, which are not taken into account but not uncommonly seen in the original Gleason uh, schema uh, have been, the, have been the, uh, the major effect here. Um, that's quickly evolved uh, because of the need for clinically relevant and patient-centered grading um, to, the, to this notion, which was ushered in by this paper in 2013 from Johns Hopkins of prognostic grade groups, that rather than grouping things as less than or equal to 6, 7, and 8 through 10, that we can probably do better than that with a five-tiered uh, five scheme. And this meta-analysis, uh, for which uh, a number of people in the room uh, participated and reviewed the statistics, um, from five institutions, international study, uh, I show the data here for you know, recurrence-free progression stratified by needle biopsy on the left and radical prostatectomy on the right, showed that this five-tier system works. And importantly, we thought this was an advance uh, that pathology was able to, you know, help with uh, in being able to tell a patient you have grade group one and not six out of ten. And I think that that has been, that notion has been widely accepted. I would comment that both from a research perspective and specifically in the realm of radiation oncology, this notion of increased discrimination of Gleason score seven. You know, that we now say a two or a three, um, which may have implications in a number of cases for the inclusion of hormones, not a non-morbid therapy uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the management schema, has also been important. Um, and this has been now included in the 2016 WHO GU classification. It's included in the AJCC histologic grading, which impacts its prognostic staging and will come into effect on January 1 of next year. Um, and importantly for this audience, is included in the NCCN guidelines. And the one I've highlighted with a box um, is of very great interest to me because one of the powers of this, I just said, is separating grade group two from grade group three. Right now, all of those patients are in the intermediate group, according to NCCN. So I think this will evolve over time with some of the markers and quantitative measures that we're going to discuss now. 
also from a research perspective, the editors of the major journals in urology have said, include this. And we're nearing the two-year mark from where they uh, said this must be included within the next two years. So this terminology of grade grouping as opposed to just Gleason score um, should, uh, should make it into the, uh, to, to, to the, to your literature readings and discussions about patients very rapidly. Let's take a step now towards tumor quantitation. And you, you say, well, we're not stepping towards tumor quantitation, we're still on grading. But this sort of takes us into that realm. And this is an early study from 2003, the question of should each core with prostate cancer be assigned a Gleason score, right? And you say, well, this is not a problem. I submit a core, I get a Gleason score. However, we don't always do things like that. And so this study showed that cases with a 448 or grade group four in one core with an, a bunch of other 336 ended up having a higher stage of prostatectomies in cases with a maximum Gleason score of four plus three or grade group three, and higher Gleason score uh, percentages. Why is that important? If we look at the, the left of this diagram, there is a lot of problems still in the, in the community um, with challenging in tumor quantitation and, and also grading related to it, depending on how we take our cores. And you can see the histologic images, what these things look like in paraffin blocks, and how you can imagine the jumbling of cores uh, that, that occurs. And i show you two relatively old predictive models, old in the sense of they are already a decade old. What you're seeing is the Stevenson preoperative nomogram and so-called the Catan indolent nomogram from 2003. What you may not see because it's a little blurry is those take the number of positive cores and the millimeters of cancer into effect. Well, if you have the jumble at the bottom on the left, it's very difficult to determine where you should even put a patient in this or any other predictive model. So uh, it could be a garbage in, garbage out type of, uh, type of situation. Probably more concerning for your, in terms of the humility of the pathology field, uh, in terms of your daily practice, is this interpretive difference. And how interfocal stroma is included or not included. So if you go to Johns Hopkins, and I, full disclosure, I'm a former uh, mentee of Dr. Epstein, but he will tell you that the image on the left is three foci of cancer discontinuously involving 90% of one core and nine millimeters of cancer, because he includes the interfocal stroma. Another pathologist will tell you that these are the same three foci of cancer involving 10%, 1.5 millimeters. And in a situation where you're making decisions about management and specifically active surveillance based on things like percent, as Andrew you know, highlighted before, uh, at, or the number, even the number of millimeters in this sense, this can have a major impact, which is so far unquantitated. There is some data to support different methods, but I actually, before taking you through the cardiac arrhythmia on top, you know, take you to the study on the bottom which preceded it, which looked at various morpho morphometric features of tumor extent in needle biopsies as predicting stage um, at, at a prostatectomy. And they found that the greatest percentage of cancer in any core, the total percentage of cancer in cores, the greatest millimeters of cancer in cores, all correlated with stage. What's important here is that they compared different measures of discontinuous involvement, and they found no significant difference. They were all significant. However, in the Hopkins data, you can see the, the, the massive you know, span, 15 to 80 percent, in difference in interpretation between the discontinuous or including the interfocal stroma versus subtracting it. And so this is something that, A, you need to know how your pathologists are doing it in order to, to interpret, um, but may benefit from further refinement of comparing these systems in a robust manner, head to head in the same patient populations with the same Gleason score, grade group, and the like. What's important about all of these things is that from very early on, we know that adding any measure of tumor quantitation to base models, predictive models, however we do it, whether it's nomograms or CAPRA or NCCN or D'Amico, adds information. Yet at some point, we seem to have stopped um, including them within, within prediction. Um, and so I take you to this tale of two patients that I like to show in pathology meetings, right? Both patients have five cores positive. I think we can quickly see that one of them has grade group two, a small percent of cancer, the rest this multifocal low-grade disease. Patient B, three, four, seven, grade group two also, but more significant disease, okay? However, if you summarize these patients, they're both grade group two, five cores positive, with the greatest percent core involvement of 50%, if that's all you extract from the report. 
And one thing that has not been done, which is present in every pathology report, is to consider weighting the number of positive cores, right? Is it that there are five cores positive or that there are five cores positive of grade group two? And that is not well uh, dealt with in, the, in, in our current models and literature. I want to mention this uh, study presented last year at the AUA uh, of over 17,000 men with uh, clinical cell uh, cycle progression uh, testing, and it evaluated a proportion of men eligible for active surveillance based on a score of less than 0.08, previously identified by, uh, by someone in the audience, uh, whose clinical pathologic criteria would traditionally disqualify them from active surveillance. Talking about specifically grade group one and a PSA of over 10, intermediate or high risk AUA groups, and especially grade group two. And you can see, looking at all of the charts, but I'll focus you on the bottom one for a moment, that within grade group two, the cell cycle progression score would suggest about 50% of patients are eligible for active surveillance. And so it's clear that this grade group specifically could use a lot more uh, piece parsing out of its heterogeneity. Um, and this may be one of the in, in, inroads to do that. The notion of quantification of pattern four on Gleason score seven that was previously mentioned. What I want you to note here is what's in bold. These are the same 0.7 millimeters of cancer in two cores. But in one core, that equates to a grade group two involving 70% of a core, which is 10% of the cancer. And in another patient, this is a grade group three involving 10% of a core, where that's 70% of the cancer, the pattern four. So you can see that same 0.7 millimeters of cancer leads to fairly radically different interpretation where you may not consider in one patient offering a surveillance strategy or a focal therapy strategy, and in another, you, you, uh, you would. And there's some data emerging to back this up. This is a study from University of Michigan led by Rohit Mehra, who trained with us, about 1,700 pa patients showing that the percent pattern four, as you increase it in a biopsy, you have more of this prediction of adverse RP findings, which were previously defined by Dr. Carroll, I think, as a primary you know, pattern four and over PT3. I'll draw your attention to two notions in this, cur in this curve. Number one, that there seems to be between 20 and 40 percent pattern four already a significant increase in so-called adverse pathology. And that even at the low end, where there's just three plus three disease, there seem to be a percentage of patients, a little over 10 percent, who also will have four plus three disease or non-organ confined disease at prostatectomy. What I'd like to note in this study is that it seems to me, looking deeply into this study over the past couple of days, although it's not well parsed out, that the majority, the overwhelming majority of, quote, adverse RP findings are actually a grade group three. Not a grade group three or higher, but just a grade group three. And so there is an active question, I think, for the urology community and the oncologists who uh, work with them is, does four plus three organ-confined disease is that enough of a reason not to consider surveying a patient? And I think that would have helped a lot in this recent study uh, published uh, EPUB ahead uh, of print in JAMA Oncology, which tried to look in the uh, low volume, for a low volume intermediate risk group that would be eligible for active surveillance and concluded that it is not because a significant percentage of that group as defined, okay, and the definition again here on the lower left and it's small, is grade group two and less than or equal to two biopsy positive cores. Not any of the other parameters. So again, we potentially have a, with deference to Dr. Epstein, a garbage in, garbage out type of situation. This could have certainly benefited from a percent pattern four being added into this study. And I will draw your attention to the fact uh, here, if I can find an arrow, that 23.2% out of the 24.7%, that's about 94% of the cases were based on the grade group adverse pathology alone, the overwhelming majority of them organ confined. And so again, the question of does that warrant not putting someone on surveillance? Mentioned briefly before, there, the good part is about our grading evolution that it's been paralleled by both molecular and now clinical data to sort of back it up. There is emerging evidence that cribriform carcinoma is actually a bad actor, okay? A series of studies from Erasmus in the Netherlands and Theo van der, Theo van der Kras, uh, now who was there and now in, in Canada, in Toronto, a series of papers from modern pathology showing the, uh, that cribriform carcinoma is associated with all types of outcomes. 
some caution here. This has not been widely corroborated. And in this latter paper, the 2017 paper at the bottom, you'll notice that they say that the presence of invasive cribriformer intraductal growth at biopsy outperforms the percentage pattern for. When you read just the abstract, though, you will find that both of them fall out in multivariable analysis when you include just the number of positive biopsy cores in the setting of radiation therapy, and that the p-values, at least, in the radical prostatectomy population are also not so hot. They are minimally significant. And so this really requires robust uh, you know, uh, corroboration. That being said, these do seem to be the cancers where the most genetic changes are taking place and the like. They've even created a term nimbosis, which means a gathering of small clouds for this, uh, for this uh, you know, entity when seen in radical prostatectomy. Well, this is a cribriform carcinoma, right? We can see these punched out spaces uh, within this. And in a former time, this would have been graded by pathologists as pattern four. No problem. Maybe even a little pattern five, some solid growth over here. However, today we do immunohistochemistry stains in this, uh, in this setting because the, the, every gland here, every duct here is surrounded by basal cells. And so the question is, is this cancer or is this intraductal growth of the cancer? Um, and so this notion of intraductal carcinoma of the prostate, already described by McNeil and Stamey back in the late 80s, early 90s, is malignant cells filling large acinire ducts. How they get there, most people assume it's a late phenomenon. However, there are now plenty of documented cases where it is a, that's the major part of the mass and they're associated with three plus threes, three plus fours, four plus threes. So not just a high grade phenomenon. There's a lot of argument if you see this finding in a biopsy alone, should you proceed to radical therapy immediately versus search for invasive carcinoma because of the near inevitable in radical prostatectomy association with high grade volume and locally advanced disease. However, there is very little biopsy data uh, in this. And the one study, for instance, on three plus three cancers that also had intraductal is a collection of Dr. Epstein's consult cases over the past 15 years. We've had anecdotally three to five cases over the past two, three years. Um, and the question is, because of these associations, should we not consider surveillance in those patients? And should we take them to immediate therapy? Should we rebiopsy them in the hopes of finding this nearly invariable high-grade disease? There's still a lot of work to be done in this area. And finally, mention ergon P10 status and specifically focus on, on P10 here. This is a series of papers from our colleague Tamara Lotan at Johns Hopkins, who's done, worked on P10 extensively. She really is, uh, is one of the authorities on this, showing associations with upgrading, upstaging, uh, and that it pred predicting for unsampled uh, Gleason uh, 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 pattern four. The question is, what do we do in this case, right? This is a case very recently seen by Victor Reuter in our center, an otherwise standard three plus three cancer. However, there was a request to do ergon P10 staining. And lo and behold, in the top right, P10 is lost. So now we have a 3-3 patient. This was the only core positive in the patient. I'm sorry, I apologize. There were two cores with three plus three, not extensive disease, okay? a perfect surveillance candidate based on PSA and other factors, and now we have P10 loss. So what are we going to do about these patients? And so with that, we'll leave you with some future directions that pathology and your friendly neighborhood pathologist, for those who are not from MSKCC, may be helpful with. Can we better design studies that actually compare apples with apples? I think we've heard a lot of that this morning. If we have all sorts of studies that include different variables, can we compare them head to head? Can we incorporate common data elements, especially in the realm of tumor quantitation, that have been in the pathology reports for 10 years, but is that rich data being used? Can we, the pathologists need to further explore the predictive or biologic significance of various morphologies, and careful incorporation of new pathologic, IHC, or, and genomic markers into decision algorithms, sort of in a stepwise head-to-head -head process. Thank you.